Tonight, we're going to delve into Genesis 1 verse 1 specifically to offer an alternative view that I think makes it much more relevant to your life. Um, in the beginning, uh, God creates the heavens and the earth. And the earth was void without form and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God comes to hover over that darkness. Now, I used to read those scriptures. And as many of you can identify with, I would read verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I would see that as God's first act of creation. That is the Big Bang. That is where galaxies and and planets and everything bursts into existence. When I started doing a little bit more critical study, and, and part of that is to just try and understand what did the author mean and what would his audience have understood, I very quickly came to the realization that they had no concept of galaxies. In fact, they had no concept of planet. So whatever they saw, it was not the same as my National Geographic inspired visions <laughs> of the, the expanse. They saw something different. And um, then oh, I discovered a, a, a Jewish scholar, Rashi, it's, I think the 12th century or so, that made a profound suggestion about how to interpret those first few verses. It caused a big uproar then, and it's actually being incorporated into many translations today because he made this simple suggestion. He said the first um, clause is a subordinate clause. In other words, he would translate Genesis 1, uh, verse 1 to 3 in this way. When God began creating the heavens and the earth, or for them it would have probably been the sky and the land, it's the same words, um, the land was uninhabitable and lifeless. It was void and without form. Kind of those words, tuhu, bavuhu, we're going to look at it further. It's the kind of words that they use to describe the desert. It's uninhabited and it was formless. Um, and, and the rest of it, and then in verse 3, then God said. Now the profound suggestion that Rashi gave is God's creative act begins in verse 3 when he speaks. Okay, now, theologically, there's a lot of things going on there because didn't God create out of nothing? There's a lot of things that can happen theologically, but kind of just flow with it for now um, <laughs> and see the heart of what he was trying to communicate. And that is that Genesis 1 verse 1 is more of a title, a preparation of what we're going to deal with in this chapter. We're going to deal with the way in which God creates. In other words, the, the author might not have had um, the same questions as we have today. Very often today, we just want to know the scientific origins, etc., of of our universe, but that's probably not what was the question they were trying to answer, especially if you compare it to the other mythology and the other kind of writings that they were in conversation with. Why is this significant? First of all, what this suggests is that God begins his creative process in the middle of the chaos and the formlessness that is there already. Hmm. <laughs> um, 
Let me, let me give you some other beautiful, just quick little insights. This, many scholars would agree that these Genesis texts were probably written during the Babylonian exile. In other words, today we read the Bible and we kind of read it like we read other books. We think the author began with Genesis 1 verse 1 and worked his way through. But the Genesis text is actually quite new compared to many other portions within the Bible. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve, it's not mentioned in the rest of the Old Testament. <laughs> Why not? Because the authors did just not know about Adam and Eve. <laughs> it wasn't written when Jeremiah and Ezekiel and these guys were writing their portions. They, they weren't aware of that story yet. Um, now, what happened during the Babylonian exile is for the first time, both Israel and Judah, two different kingdoms that have similar origins, but they they different kingdoms and they don't always get along with one another. And in fact, they've got two different traditions, oral traditions. And for the first time, both these groups are, are uh, taken over by Babylon. And what happens to many other nations, they just lose their identity. Because obviously the Babylonian gods are better than our gods. That's why we lost and they won. But Israel has this, uh, and, uh, and Judah has this emerging thought of uh, one God, of monotheism. And so they interpret it not as other gods is stronger than our God, because there is only one God. They interpret this as a discipline. Our God is disciplining us, and so we can retain our identity even in the midst of this. Um, this is going to get relevant to you really soon. Are you okay? <laughs> Are you okay with a bit of history, a bit of thought around the construction of those books? This is why, in the first five books of the Bible, almost every story is repeated twice. There's two creation stories, two stories of Abraham's covenant with God, two stories of Israel. Every story is repeated twice. In the one story, God is named. Yahweh, and in the other story, he is named Elohim, until God reveals himself to Moses as Yahweh. And so they call these two sources the Yahweh source and the Elohim source. And um, they, they're not the same story. <laughs> so Genesis 1 verse 1 until 2 verse 4, it's Elohim story from Israel. From verse 2 to f verse 4 onwards, it's Yahweh's story. And it's a bit different because in, in the first story, God creates plants, animals, then man. Genesis 2 verse 4 onwards, God creates man first. And when he sees man, he's alone, so he creates some animals. <laughs> and then he creates Eve. So there's a different sequence in the Yahweh story. But it's during the time that they are in exile in um, Babylon that these stories, there's a real urgency for them to preserve their culture and bring their stories together, that they merge them together. And the predominant thought in Babylon at that time, what they hear week after week, is the story of Enuma Elish which is the Syrian word for when God began creating. <laughs> okay, And so they in Babylon, every week there's a ritual. They are slaves. They, they are subjected every change of season. There's this continual telling of the Enuma Elish story. I'll give you just a, a little introduction. Basically, in the beginning, when God began creating, there was Absud, the male personification of chaos, and Tiamut, the female personification of chaos. And they, their waters commingled, and they had lots of children. And um, 
then the children became very noisy and Apsu eventually said, my goodness, they are driving me crazy. Shall we just get rid of him? It's a wonderful bedtime story. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Tiamut eventually said, yes, let's just eliminate them. Uh, but, but one of the one of them overheard it here. She ran back, told all the children, and eventually Malduk um, uh, comes and he fights against Tiamut. He blows the evil wind into a body that splits her in half, and he takes this body, and from one half he makes the earth, and from the other half he makes the heavens. Now, um, why is this relevant? You see, as Israel and Judah is subjected to this story over and over again, a story in which violence is redemptive. God brings order to the chaos with violence. And by the way, evil is best personified by a female um, chaotic monster in that culture. <laughs> okay. How beautiful it is as within these authors, a different vision of God arises. A vision in which chaos is not evil. So you see, when they first start telling the story, the people around them would recognize the story. Oh, it's in English, when God began creating. There was chaos. It sounds the same as our story. But then the surprise there's no violence. This God doesn't create through violence and through force and through manipulation. This God creates through speaking a creative word and, and bringing greater and greater distinction into that chaos. And, and by the way, the chaos is not even evil. It's so beautiful, that word that we've translated, and there was darkness on the face of the deep, that word deep. Hebrew, Tamut, is the Hebrew equivalent of Tiamut. <laughs> so it puts in the same kind of words, words that they would recognize. But what's happening here? Tuhu bavuhu, the formlessness, the uninhabitable lifelessness, the the chaos and the void. But in Hebrew, these words combined has got a greater poetic value. It's, it's the tuhu bavuhu. There's a poetic echo within it. And so it, it starts painting this picture of a chaos in which a murmuring is starting to occur. There's, there's a there's an echo. There's a note with something that sounds almost similar, but it's a differentiating note. It, 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 it's something very deep is concealed by this chaos. But a distinction is starting to happen. Tu hu bavuhu. Tu hu bavuhu. It's this echo that starts reverberating in the heart of the deep. And if ever you've studied a bit of chaos theory, all those things, when, when chaos becomes unstable, that's where creative things happen. <laughs> and it's almost like this reverberation eventually bursts into voice. <laughs> and in verse 3, And God said. In other words, the point of all of that story is to suggest this, that chaos is not God's enemy. There's nothing in the text that says it is evil. But if we just stay with the text, it actually seems that it is the very stuff from which God creates beauty. Okay? It is over this formless, chaotic, tuhu bavuhu that the spirit of Elohim hovers. <laughs> and then we find the next, you know, five days, a very 
beautiful, also poetic and rhythmic way in which God says, and it is so, the, 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 the movement from word to creative action uh, uh, is seamless. It just happens. And God said, and it was so. And God said, and it was so. The rhythm continues. The two who bursts forth into voice and God creates. But then suddenly in, on day six, there's a hesitation. There's, a, the, 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 it, there's no clear flow from word to action. There's, it's almost like the echo hears itself and there's this pause. And it's no longer, and God said, and it was so. It's, and God said, let us make man. The language becomes more complex. It becomes self-reflective. Let us. And it's the expression of a desire. And isn't it profound that the very thing that separates human consciousness is the fact that it is so self-reflective. That we are able to, to reflect on our own meaning and our own, uh, uh, own existence. And so the very words, let us create man, our image, our likeness, something else is starting to happen here. Now, let me first try and bring you back to what does this have to do with my life? You see, if the Genesis story is just an interesting account of what happened a long time ago, um, it's interesting. <laughs> we can maybe learn some things about God. But if the intention was to show us the way in which God always creates, in other words, creation is not a historic event, but creation is an ongoing process that's happening even now. You are sustained in existence by the word of his power. <laughs> Every molecule in your body. You know, when we, did, when we discovered the atom, we thought, oh, we found the smallest piece of matter. And let's see what it is. And we, we peered into the atom and we discovered, my goodness, it's nothing except for a very little bit of something that moves very quickly. It's almost like if I took a baseball, I put a, a fishing line onto it and I swang it around me very quickly, you wouldn't be able to approach me from any direction without hitting the ball. But around me, there's much more nothing that's, than something. It's just that the something moves so quickly that you, you can't come close. And so we wanted to find out what is the nature of reality. And so we peer in deeper what makes an atom an atom. And we find these weird little things called quarks that pops in and out of existence. And we don't know where they come from, where they go. Uh, and so the more we try and find something, the more we find nothing. And uh, so that chair you're sitting on is more nothing than something. <laughs> Now, one of the ideas that many scientists are picking up on now is that if we have to go to the very nature of the energy that sustains all existence, we probably call it sound energy. So every, every vibration, every difference in frequency produces a different element. So you've got one frequency that produces helium, one frequency that produces oxygen, but all of it is frequencies of sound. I cannot but help. Remember Hebrews 1 verse 3, that he sustains all things in existence by the sound. <laughs> of his power, by the word of his power. In other words, God didn't just speak a long time ago and now he's quiet. The very vibration that keeps every atom in your body 
<laughs> in its position is the voice of God. <laughs> Can you feel God <laughs> vibrating, <laughs> hovering over this chaos? <laughs> Even quantum physics these days have got such beautiful ways of thinking of, uh, you know, how do we describe that moment before creation where all our physical laws break down and we, we, we don't have any reference of describing it. And I love the kind of words they go into because it's, <laughs> even though they think it's new, it's been the intuition of people for so long. They describe it as a field of infinite possibility. <laughs> uh, and what happens in this field of infinite possibilities is this, there's a bit of a fluctuation that makes one possibility more likely than another. <laughs> there's this two, boo too, boo -boo. There's this sound that starts to vibrate and eventually there's this voice <laughs> and creation <laughs> bursts into existence. Now what, how does this relate to you? Well, if this is how God creates and how God still creates, it makes it so relevant to your life. Because not many of us would describe our lives as perfect order. <laughs> not many of us would describe our existence as um, inerrant perfection. Most of us would acknowledge that there's something within our stories, within our, with, within our existence, that is a little bit chaotic still. <laughs> and we often try and avoid that chaos. But to actually come to that beautiful conclusion that this, this moment is the moment of creative chaos, where God does his best work. <laughs> Ooh. Suddenly, your chaotic, formless, lifeless situation takes on new meaning. Because how does God create? He doesn't just, as we said yesterday, make the fish in the heavenly aquarium, throws them into the ocean. And there it is. No, God speaks to the substance from which he wants to make something new. And he invites his creation to participate with him in that creation. So he speaks to the sea. And he says, see, won't you bring forth life? Don't you know what beauty, what possibility, what opportunity for life is resident in you. <laughs> and the sea brought forth. And so God created. In other words, God does not create in isolation. <laughs> God's creative action happens together with creation. <laughs> With him inviting you and saying, if anything good, if anything beautiful is going to happen, it's because you are going to hear my call. <laughs> it's because you are going to start discerning this possibility that something truly new and truly beautiful is possible for me. That's God. Why don't you sense it right now? Take a deep breath. <sighs> Yahweh. Yahweh. <laughs> Spirit of God. <laughs> and now just as you, <sighs> as you receive this gift of God's breath, just discern that call. 
that says something beautiful and something truly new is possible <laughs> for you. So in John 1 verse 1, the word that was in the beginning, that was with God, that was God, all things were made through him and not one thing exists except through him. Not one thing, not one thing exists except through this voice, <laughs> through this God that sustains all things in existence. Remember what we said last night? God does not exist as a being amongst other beings. He is the source of all existence. And this is kind of what John is starting to say. This, this word through which all things exist. Um, verse 10, it says, and this word was in the world. In other words, Jesus is not the first time that God enters our world and says, okay, I've left these guys alone for a long time now and they're still messing up. Let me go there personally. It's as if we somehow in our theology imagine that Father, Son and Holy Spirit created it all and we, we'd send our messages and our words and after a few thousand years we see they just don't get it. You know, one of us will have to go down there and sort it out. And Jesus draws the short straw and <laughs> so with quite a bit of reluctance he becomes human. Because you know it's quite a downgrade if you were if you were omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent to suddenly be stuck in one body at one time, in one place, and it even says there he could not do many mighty works. <laughs> no, that's a strange kind of omnipotence. So that is you, you can see that suddenly the human condition in our concepts of God is a very big downgrade, but, but the stain of John tells us that this is not the first time God experienced what it's like to be part of creation. <laughs> Verse 14, and the word became flesh, tabernacled with us, dwelled in us. So there is obviously something very unique about Jesus. But what's unique about Jesus is not that this is the first time God realizes what it's like to be human. As if Jesus after, you know, 30 years go back and says, Whew, Father, that, that was a bit more difficult. This being human thing is tougher than what we've imagined from up here. Let's just... I mean, let's cut them some slack. Let's cut the rules in half. Call it grace. Just make it a little bit easier on them. Um, no, something else is busy happening here. <laughs> Jesus is the first time that we know that God knows <laughs> what it's like to be human. Because all all of creation is incarnation. <laughs> Nothing exists except through this word pouring himself out into existence. Every tree, every particle, this is why Job can say the breath of every living thing is the Spirit of God. Even that puppy dog breath <laughs> is kept into, in existence by this God who pours himself out grace upon grace <laughs> into the existence of all things. So Jesus is not the first time where God lands in the alien world and tries to have some influence on it. 
this God has always been the sustaining power of everything that exists. There is not one experience that one human being has ever had that God has not experienced it with them. And in Jesus, he comes to demonstrate the depth of his identification with us. The depth of him having fun with us, laughing with us, enjoying the simplicity of flowers and birds and beautiful parables and ideas and relationships. But he also experiences the depth of our confusion. Of our doubt, as some of the early church fathers said, it is what? When they try to articulate the way in which God saved, they didn't use our legal language. That came out much later with Anselm and then further with Luther and Calvin. And all. We, we've developed a big legal category into, to understanding salvation. But the first church fathers understood it very simply. They said it this way. God saves what he becomes. <laughs> and he heals what he assumes. And so the incarnation is as much a part of our understanding of salvation as what happens at the cross or the resurrection. You can't separate this. This is God demonstrating how he enters into your world. But he's not some foreign deity out there watching you from a distance. But the God who's intertwined with your flesh, with your tissue. <laughs> and how does he heal your doubt? Maybe when he cries out, my God, my God, why? Maybe this is the place where the omniscient God experiences what it's like not to know all things. <laughs> Maybe this is where the omnipotent God experiences what it's like to be weak, to be powerful, uh, powerless. Maybe this is the moment in which he assumes our doubt so that we can become partakers of his faith. Where he enters into the depth of our alienation, into the depth of our confusion, because that's how he heals it. You see, the kind of God that just speaks to us from a distance and says, hey guys, I see you've had a tough time lately, but I've got a good idea. Why don't we forget about all that bad stuff and just concentrate on the beautiful stuff and we go further, okay? Is that a good idea? With that God, we can legitimately argue and say, I don't know you, I don't think you've got the clue. I, I can't just let go. <laughs> of maybe the injustice that was done to me or maybe even harder the injustice I've done to others. It's not something to just let go. But the kind of God who demonstrates his understanding of you by entering your experience with you. And this is what's written, I think it's in Ephesians, for this reason, he descended and ascended that he may fall all things. In other words, in a sense, you know, in our Western way of thinking, three-dimensional space and time, we sometimes interpret that as there was a time a long time ago when Jesus died, where he went to a place called hell and he got the keys, did whatever he had to be, and then he left and is now in some other place, heaven kind of waiting for things to unfold further. But that's not what that scripture says, it says he descended, ascended, so that he may fill all things. So in a sense, I can say God is still in hell. <laughs> what do I mean by that? This is what I mean. There is no 
place of suffering and of torment where you've got to go and grab the person by the hand and say, let me first lead you out of here and introduce you to God. But what we can do is in your greatest confusion and torment, we can introduce you to the God who has experienced everything you've experienced with you. <laughs> now this God who understands you to that depth, to that God we can give our ear when he says now, now that I've experienced your hell with you, now that I've been in your torment with you, I need you to listen. I've become everything you are so that you can be all I am. There is a resurrection that follows this death. This is not the end of your story. <laughs> There's some surprises coming. There's some spectacular, astonishing possibilities. And so the church fathers would say, the, the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. <laughs> he became all you are so that you can be all he is. He assumed your doubt so that you can experience his faith. He assumed your confusion so that you can be astonished with his beauty. <laughs> and so this God is not some alien invader with some new bright ideas of how we can do a little bit better than what we have so far. You see, how is it possible for God to become human and still remain fully God? Because huh. that is the, the, the very foundation of the Christian faith. That, that this human being somehow embodies the person and the message of God in a way that is very difficult to articulate, but we've, we, we're getting closer. I, think, I hope so. Maybe it's infinite. Maybe we know closer than ever before. But if our ideas begin with omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, if that's where our ideas of God begin, it's very difficult to understand how Jesus could be fully God. <laughs> but I think God lets us in on the secret in 1 Corinthians 13 when he starts speaking to Paul. He says, Paul, I know you guys are very impressed with knowledge. I know uh, uh, um, omniscience is, or let's start with power. You know, I know you guys are very impressed with power, but you know what? Even if you had the power and the faith to move mountains and, and speak and it's done, but you have not love, you are nothing. In other words, Paul, um, it is not my power that makes me me. Ha <laughs> ha! And today, the word God is almost synonymous with omnipotence. <laughs> this is not the God revealed in Jesus. He comes to offend us with his weakness. <laughs> a, a persistent weakness. <laughs> the persistent weakness of his love that overcomes our brute force. And so... He carries on, and, and Paul, I know you guys are very impressed with knowledge. I mean, but if you could speak with the tongues of angels and know all things, that's uh, omniscience. Yet you have not love. You are nothing. In other words, Paul, it's not my knowledge that makes me me. 
You see, the reason God could become human and remain fully God is that the, because the one thing that makes God God is love. And the human condition is in no way a limitation for the love of God to be communicated. That's why every time you love, God is being himself in you. <laughs> Why don't we give God a little bit of freedom this evening? Just let a bit of love pour out. Just kind of think of the people around you. Just let that love flow a little bit. Think of family. Think of people. Just let your life pour a bit. Can you, can you sense God just getting all excited? <laughs> He's living. <laughs> Expressing himself, becoming flesh in you. Whenever you love, God is being himself in you. Hmm. Now, either I can tell this, or I want to quickly put this on Mary Ann if she prefers. I want to, uh, to just tell that little experience. I mean, you can make it this big or short, but I want that, that point of love is what remains. Mm. So beautiful to allow ourselves to just be embraced by love himself and to realize that that we are because He loves us. <laughs> we are because we are loved. And um, so to try and put it in a very short nutshell, um, I had an experience where I, I um, came very close to not being with you all, um, and we had embarked on a cycle journey and on the way I was stung by a yellow jacket hornet mm. and not realizing that I had a quite a violent reaction to it. Um, within seconds, you know, well, within minutes it started happening. And so my hand started to tingle, my head started to pound and I realized something was happening and I called out to Andre louder. <laughs> I didn't call out louder, <laughs> but I called out loudly to him. Something's happening, antihistamine. Um, and so he ran off and during that space of time, I lost consciousness. And so what had happened was that I, I fell on the ground and, um, and in that moment, which looking, rewinding back on it or having discussed it afterwards, I could eventually find the words to describe. But in that moment of losing consciousness, losing all self as I knew it <laughs> then, um, I had this immediate sense that I was embraced and loved, that there was no fear here, that there was no fear, that that love was holding and enveloping and embracing me. And so in this moment where it's chaos and everyone around is panicking and um, rushing around, calling emergency services and I was oblivious to that, but in this place of absolute embrace. And what I was conscious of in that moment was just this overwhelming movement and color and light and welcome and embrace. And that I was enveloped in this, this wonderful, beautiful movement dance called love. And so when I'd discussing this later, 
when I'd come around, and Andre said he actually observed me. I mean, he, he had tried to bring me by and shove antihistamine in my mouth. Uh, emergency services were, were on the way. And I was brought back by a call of the young German um, shop attendant who, in a very broken German accent, <laughs> I just heard the words, no, no, come back. And I came back <laughs> and um, and he, he said as I came back I was I was going like this it was and all I can describe at chatting afterwards was that it was like coming from a three-dimensional place to a two-dimensional place and what was temporal what was meaningless vanished into embrace of love and what was love remained what was love was eternal and so in that eternal moment of being here it wasn't some other place some other time it was right here right now in the envelop entanglement of love and all that I wanted to do when I came round was to just grab every person I encountered and just hug them and just love them and embrace them and tell them how valuable they were and that you are just amazing mm -hmm. and I love you. <laughs> and um, And that is what we all are embraced and if we will just breathe in this beautiful embrace called love that our papa desires to just totally envelop us and include us into his reality into this beautiful connection into this beautiful embrace called love that is every single person's portion and that every single person is enveloped in this encounter and um, I don't know if I've left anything out <laughs> because it all became just a whirlwind of you know people spoke afterwards you know when I'd, I'd written a little bit about it and, and some folk asked afterwards um, how awful it must have been so terrible and uh, to be honest I, I couldn't speak of the experience as terrible or awful it was just beautiful and and I almost felt guilty about saying you know but not <laughs> and um, and it was such an encouragement I, I think one of the things that it also meant so much to Andre is when he started questioning me on the experience and I said, I was gone. And he said, yes, I know, you were unconscious. And I said, no, but I was in a beautiful place. And he suddenly just, what? And he's inquiring, mind, where? Where were you? What? what? <laughs> Who was there? Who was there? <laughs> and that one thing I'd said to him in, in, in just a flash of a moment when he said, Who was there? I said, you were. And that was such an encouragement for him because in his, to his, in his perspective, he thought he'd lost me. But in my view, <laughs> he was there all along. <laughs> but there's no distance in love and there's no separation in love. And so many people who'd emailed me in the subsequent weeks saying, I lost a brother, I lost a father, I lost a friend through anaphylactic shock. And this has meant so much to me that I know that they are present and that they are here. I, I mourn their physical loss, but there's no distance in love. Yeah. Amen. Do you want to grab your guitar quickly? No, mm. I'll say one or two more things quickly while she's just grabbing her guitar. Can you see the continuation from yesterday? You are a story. But the context of your story is not in the middle of some great loss and hopefully some gain in the future. But the context of your story is right in the middle of your mess. 
right in the middle of your chaos is where God does his best work. <laughs> it's in the contrast of this life that love becomes most distinct and beautiful. And so it's right here, your existence, that God's excited about being himself through you. <laughs> and so many people who've, who've had that kind of near-death experiences will testify, and, and, and they've made compilations of their testimonies, and one thing they all have in common is a kind of experience where, in a way, they experience their whole life, but what is highlighted is the moments in which they loved and the moments in which they learned. And it's almost like they sense that that is all that remains of me, which is the only thing worth remaining. <laughs> You've got such a beautiful opportunity to co-author the most exciting story with God. And there's no limits to what he wants to communicate through you, for you, with you. Mary Ann. And so after Mary Ann did a few songs, I'll get this all wired up. We'll go into a bit of a conversation. Great. Thank you. distance um, you know we all know the word Yahweh um, which is we put the, the vowels in to be able to say the word but originating in the Hebrew is Y-H-B-H um, just the letters and and so in in a mindset of of folk in that time who thought that God was so distant and so uninvolved with their reality. They said, well, this is the unpronounceable name, the unmentionable name. We can't, God is so holy and so distant, we, we can't say his name. And it's so interesting to me that recently Hebrew linguists have, have shown us that those words, you know, the Y-H-V-H, that if they have to describe them, because you can't say it's a consonant or a vowel, it's kind of, they say, it's the sound of breathing. So if you have to say it, and so I just find it amazing that even in our concepts of God that, oh, he's so far off, he gives himself a name that's the sound of our breathing. Mm -hmm. That we can't but say his name when we take a breath. Yeah. <laughs> and when a baby is born, is it that they may, must take their first breath to be alive? Or is it that the name of God must be on their lips for them to truly be alive? And, and so, um, so I wrote this a few years ago, but I was so touched the other day when a friend of ours, her young son, just been born, was battling, fighting for his life um, with pneumonia and just complications during birth, and his lungs just refused to function properly. And um, she messaged me in the hospital, and she said she became so aware she had him enfolded in her arms and she just began to breathe and sing Yahweh, Yahweh and just breathing the breath of life with him and, um, and he so wonderfully recovered and I just rejoice to think of that little life who's now just turned one. <laughs> than the heart in my chest Nearer than the words on my lips Easier than breathing in Surer than the breath 
blowing out. Why don't you sing with closer? Closer than the heart in my chest. Near in the words. Near in Breath you've given to me.